Tough Realities, The Political Scene Peak Oil Matthew Simmons served as energy advisor to U.S. President George W. Bush. His book Twilight in the Desert, The Coming Saudi Oil Shock and the World Economy is a thoughtful examination of oil reserve decline rates, a phenomenon that points to the idea of peak oil, the concept that the world's supply of effectively extractable oil is declining. Craig Shield, I read your book, Twilight in the Desert. It certainly explains your position very well, or at least the position that you had at that point. Excellent stuff. Med Simmons, thanks very much. C.S. Peak Oil, in my estimation, is one of probably four or five good reasons to head in this direction, and it's a heck of a good one. M.S. Oh, it's the only one that basically forces you to do it. C.S. Well, from the position of someone who might not know an awful lot about peak oil, or may even be skeptical of the position, how would you articulate it? M.S. The first thing is to make people understand what you mean by peak oil. Unfortunately, most of the critics of peak oil think it means we've run out of oil, and it doesn't mean anything like that. It means we've peaked. And we're never really going to run out of oil. We'll always have some oil. We might not have any we want to use, but we'll always have oil. But when the flow rate starts to decline, you have to use less. I'm going to stick on the supply side for a minute. What's unfortunate is how little data we have of high quality that really pins down how real this issue is. With the exception of a handful of key oil-producing countries who have created genuine petroleum transparency field by field, and that includes all the participants in the North Sea and Mexico, we have no data on the flow rate from the rest of the world's oil fields. Now, you can really dig around, which is what I spent a decade doing, and getting lots of data on the flow rates per field or you could wait until the producing country's flow rates have been in decline for three or four years before you say well obviously that country has peaked in its oil supply. C.S. Right. But, what is the imperative of these people to tell you anything about it, and least of all, the truth? M.S. Well, it's in everyone's best interests to be honest about this because the people it hurts the worst are the producing countries. In fact, ironically, I had a reporter in Dubai from Bloomberg email me this morning to get some comments on an article she's doing on the 50th anniversary of OPEC. And her questions were, do you think OPEC will be viable 50 years from now? And, what should they be doing to strengthen their organization, and, what changes do you think they should make? I basically said that I think within 20 years most of the OPEC producers will not be able to export oil anymore, because their internal use is rising fast and their internal supply flow is shrinking. C.S. Right. But you said something else interesting there that I'd like to ask you about. I would think that it would be in the interest of OPEC to lie about this, insofar as a moment that even the skeptics in the United States realize A, the reality of peak oil and B, that we are right there, even the oil people are going to run for renewables. MS, well, C. The problem is that we can't run for renewables because there really aren't very many that we know of that will actually change the bar. But what is interesting is if the world believed that OPEC had 4 to 6 million barrels, per day, of excess capacity they are just shutting down and we all of a sudden had a tremendous price rise and shortages, we'd bomb OPEC to get their oil. C.S. Wow. That's quite a statement. M.S., you could almost make book on it. Because you could say if those, and I'm being particularly pejorative because it's the way we would think, if those greedy Arabs, and I still vividly remember John McCain saying the Arabs have all this oil and we should not let them use it. 
and we would have schizophrenia about the Arabs and sooner or later somebody would say, we need to bomb them and get the oil because we are ruining our economies. C.S. Well I personally believe that, but I must say that I'm surprised to hear it from you. The concept that we go to war for oil is something that I think a lot of Americans believe in our hearts, but I don't know that there is any proof of that, and it is certainly vehemently denied by whomever we have in power. M.S. Michael Clare, a very good writer and documentarian from Amherst, has a documentary movie out called Blood and Oil, and it showed how from World War II on, Every single administration has acknowledged that our wars are always fought over the oil. C.S. Okay. Well that's good to know. I'm glad we got that out on the table. M.S. C. Mexico, for instance, is one of the few countries that decided they needed to be transparent in the field by field flow rate and be very clear that Contero was in decline so that people understand and sympathize with them. Then they could finally say, within a year or two we can no longer export oil to the United States, as opposed to thinking that some greedy Mexican is trying to get the price up. C.S. I understand. Well. Speaking of manipulating the price, can you speak to that for a second? Many people attribute the 2008 skyrocketing gasoline prices in the United States to manipulation. MS, over the course of 10 years, from the fall of 1998 when oil prices were at 10 to the early summer of 2008 when prices were over 140. CS, right. In dollars per barrel. MS, that's a long, long, period of time to have prices rise that high. And what happened is that demand far exceeded supply. I mean, throughout the price rise it was blamed on speculators and manipulation and so forth. You don't do that for a decade. The stranger thing was that in the fall of 2008, the price had sort of come off as we started worrying about our weakening economy. And on September 22nd it was $122 a barrel, and on December 22nd it was $32 a barrel. That was the oddity. We should say, how did that ever happen? And then, surprisingly enough, it took three months just hanging around the $30 level before we had the two big rises. It went back to $60 in 4 months and then it stayed there for 2 months and then it went up to $80 in the next 4 months. So in 2009 we had the highest single rise in the price of oil in a single year in the last 40 years. CS, right. Both percentage wise and MS. And in total dollars. And now we have the worst cold weather we've had in the Northern Hemisphere in decades, and my guess is that oil prices pretty soon will be back over $100. C.S. Okay. Let's go back to the subject of peak oil. If you don't mind just documenting the proof points of this thing for the skeptic. M.S. Well, the proof points begin with a number of very important key oil producers. Nobody's data is perfectly accurate because of the way we measure oil flows, but take the North Seas for instance. This was the last great significant new frontier. Between the two big producers in that area, Norway and the UK, in 1999 the North Sea produced 6.1 million barrels a day and today it's down to about 2.5. Mexico's Cantarell field peaked in 2005 at 2.2 million barrels a day and today it's 500,000 barrels a day. The North Slope peaked at 2 million barrels a day in 1989 and today they struggle with about 600,000 barrels a day. So you can go through enough of these individual countries and say, how would we ever basically just replace the Cantarell and the North Sea? The truth is that we can't. C.S. Do you mind addressing the position of people who say, 
Well, there is so much oil and shale and tar sands and so forth. MS, right. Unconventionals. The problem with the unconventionals can be summed up in a single word, they're unconventional. And they cost an enormous amount to turn them into flow rates. They also use a remarkably high amount of water, and oftentimes other energy. The oil sands of Canada use just a phenomenal amount of potable water and natural gas to actually steam it out of the sands. In California, something like two-thirds of their oil supply comes from Kern County's heavy oil, and while the San Joaquin Valley is one of the key food supply sources of America, they're having a very serious drought. And yet what are they doing? They're basically taking potable water and natural gas to create steam to do steam soaks to get heavy oil out of the ground that then needs to be refined about four times more than a typical light oil would do before it's usable. So we ought to ban that stuff because basically it's an energy destroyer. And I think as we move into the future, we are going to end up becoming far more alarmed about our water scarcity than we are our oil scarcity. And people are going to start to get more educated on how much water we consume to create usable energy. So yes, that's exactly what I was going to ask next. That is, this seems to take its place in an entire constellation of shortages and scarcities. Please go ahead. MS, the worst shortage is always water, because without water we die. And I wasn't aware of some of the water statistics until the last six months when I finally waded in and started reading two or three of the best books out on the subject. Planet Water is a really first-rate book, and Blue Covenant, which I finished over the holidays, is another first-rate book. And I would definitely recommend Cadillac Desert, which was written in 1985 about water scarcity in the West 25 years have gone by, and we are headed into some water scarcity issues that are really scary, but look at the incredible amount of water that we used to basically create usable oil. One of the statistics that surprised me the most, in fact ironically just as you called I was asking our refinery analysts to check and see whether this number is in the ballpark of being accurate, is that a refinery uses 21 million gallons of water an hour. CS, yes, that's amazing. MS, it is amazing. So you think of the amount of water that's used to extract oil. A lot of the major oil fields are doing water injection to basically create artificial reservoir pressure to force the oil out of the ground, and then when you get to refine it, we just chew up water to get oil. And the water basically has no cost to it. Well, sooner or later, you're going to insist that the oil companies pay for the water. And it will probably triple the price of oil. CS. Wow! How interesting! What would you say are the consequences of peak oil? MS, the biggest consequence is that we have developed a society that is addicted to oil. And the poster child of this society happens to be China, who we are just getting started on the relentless drive to become like us. And then right behind them is India. Well if India and China ended up with no population growth, which is impossible, and ended up finally climbing up the ladder and consuming as much oil as Mexico does today on a per capita basis, which is about a fifth of what the United States does, it would take another 45 million barrels a day of oil. Which is obviously impossible. CS, right. And what's the production right now in terms of millions of barrels per day? MS, crude oil is 72 million barrels per day. Total petroleum is about 85. So we are squeezing out the rest through a bunch of miracles. The 72 is going to drop to 60 within the next 5 to 10 years. While we at the very minimum have a world that is expecting to use 105 to 120 million barrels a day two decades from now. 
CS. I understand that we've become addicted to oil in a very real sense of the word, but I guess my question is what are the consequences of that addiction, in terms of international relations, human suffering, that kind of thing. MS. The consequences are pretty simple. We don't have any way to basically regulate the use, because the users of oil have no idea of when we're almost empty. It's just like, have you ever run out of gas? CS, yes. MS, don't you feel stupid when you run out of gas? CS, yes, in fact I do. MS, I've never asked anyone that who has never run out of gas, and I've never had someone say no. No, I knew I was going to run out of gas. You just forget to look at your gas gauge. We have no national, let alone global, gas gauge. And at some point, our motor stops and we're where we were right after Hurricane Ike. We had about two and one half weeks of service station outages spreading from east of Houston all the way down to the middle of Florida and up to Baltimore. If we had that happen again, and we hadn't had the financial crisis going on, it would have been the lead news event every night and then the motorists would have topped off their tanks. That's just the way we clear the shelves of water when hurricanes approach. And within 30 hours, we would have drained the usable gasoline supplies around the service stations of America and we would end up with social chaos. And within a week we'd be out of food. C.S. So here's a question for you. I'd like to end by asking what we should do. In particular, can we ameliorate this with renewable energy? You seem to be saying that we are a long way from renewable energy. M.S. Well, most of the forms of renewable energy have one of two problems. They either take decades to scale to where they'd make a difference in size or we basically don't have the technology to do it. There is a laundry list of renewables that people are talking about, and certainly the Obama administration has been on the warpath to create a lot of these targets, but none of the numbers work. C.S., you know, there are people who would disagree with you. M.S., yeah, I know. I talk to a lot of them. But they don't have their homework. CS, I'm sure you've seen stuff on solar thermal, concentrating solar power, the Alsras and Oppengaus and so forth of the world. If we're betting on a technology, I don't think it'll be here two years hence but I would say 15 or 20 years. A solar thermal farm the shape of a square 100 miles on a sod would give us more than enough power for the entire continent of North America. MS, yeah, if we had superconductivity. C, the problem is I don't think realistically we'll have electric vehicles that will replace even 10% of the vehicles in the United States within the next two or three decades. CS, really? MS, well look at the experience of Toyota. A year ago last summer, Toyota finally sold its millionth car, a Prius. And it took 10 years. It took the previous 10 years to design it. We have 280 million vehicles in the United States. So 1 million electric cars, let alone 10 million, just don't even end up as a spit in the ocean. C.S., I do understand that. But I'm a little miffed with the auto OEMs for not moving on this thing. Toyota's a wonderful example of a company that was already considered to be green with its Prius and could have put a plug hybrid on the road eight years ago if they wanted to. But there just simply was nothing in it for Toyota. M.S., C., in my opinion, the turbo diesel was about four times a better car than the hybrids and diesel is easier for a refinery to make. I drive a 320D Mercedes that's about three years old now, and the new model's apparently almost 30% more energy efficient. Driving around Houston in stop and go traffic I get about 25 to 30 miles per gallon. 
On the open road I get 40 to 45. I think we can end up where light rail works through electricity. That's the closest thing we'll get to using electricity to transport people. CS, right. And what about the Nissan Leaf? Maybe I'm just drinking the EV Kool-Aid here, but it seems to me that we're just a couple of years away from production-scale small EVs. Basically every OEM, BMW has a Mini, Mitsubishi has the iMev, everybody's trying to do this. MS, but the problem is, if it worked better than everyone thinks, Realistically could we really think that we would have 40 million on the highways within two decades? CS, sure. MS, well, if we did how does that compare to the 900 million vehicles we have on the road today? CS, well yeah, right. I'm talking about the United States, but let me just cut to the chase and ask, what is the answer? MS. In my opinion, the answer is something that I'm heavily involved in now in Maine which is called the Ocean Energy Institute. Our big project that we have underway is to create in the Gulf of Maine the experimental proof that you can turn off shore wine through electricity into liquid ammonia and have that replace motor gasoline and diesel fuel and jet fuel. That's something that actually works in internal combustion engines. So once we've proved this, you can see within 5 years maybe 2,000 of these turbines around the coast of China and Brazil and West Africa and the Persian Gulf, so the future is liquid ammonia. CS, ok, well that's very interesting. Offshore wind, a lot of people are talking about this. MS, the University of Maine has created an advanced composite that's the strongest, lightest material ever made. And it has almost no energy content. CS, do you know what it's called? MS, Advanced Composite. That's what they call it. It's a trademark secret, but it's basically resins and sand and sawdust and it's just a remarkable thing, and they've made bridge spans crossing the Penobscot River, so they stress test these things. In three months they put 80 years of truck traffic simulation on it and I've seen two people hold up the bridge span. So this stuff actually works and this will allow in the Gulf of Maine in deep enough water to use a certain design to create huge wind turbines every 5 miles apart. With all these alternative energies I hear people talk about, liquid ammonia is the one everybody has missed. And I will have to say. This is something that I did my research on and figured out it was going to work. CS, well great. So then do you consider us safe? Do you think that this is a bankable process? MS, no, I think that we're going to have to go on an effort with the intensity of the Manhattan Project, like our work after Pearl Harbor. We have about 5 years to basically figure this out and prove to the world that we'll be cranking out the advanced composite wind turbines like we did Liberty ships. Go to the website, oceanenergy.org, cs, but where is all this effort going to come from? Certainly not traditional energy companies, I would think. I don't want to be crass about this thing. But it seems to me that if you are Chevron saying, imagine an oil company being part of the solution you're talking to people who simply don't believe you. They are not part of the solution. They're trying to milk to pump the last ounce of crude out of the ground. MS, that's very accurate when it comes to Shell, BP and Exxon. Chevron is almost bold enough to break out and say that they actually acknowledge peak oil. I had never met Jim Mulder, the chairman and CEO of ConocoPhillips until the oil and money conference in London this fall. He was so friendly. He said you know I'm just embarrassed. I kept dying to just pick up the phone sometime and call you and get acquainted because I love what you write. So I said. Well, when I'm back in Houston, let's get together.
We spent two and one half hours talking. He said, I just don't think there's a big rosy future for the oil business and I kept hearing people telling me that shale gas was the answer and I was so impressed to hear you speak up in London and say no, shale gas is a bunch of crap. So first of all I'd like you to tell me why you think that. 30 minutes later he said, holy cow, I'm glad I didn't get into that. But finally he asked. Is there anything you see on the horizon that is exciting? This is pretty depressing. I said oh yeah, offshore energy, offshore wind, liquid ammonia. And within half an hour he said, this is actually the most exciting conversation I've had in my business career. C.S. How interesting. This would have been a much less important book, had I not had this conversation. MS, well, I'm glad you're doing it. We need education so badly on this issue. What's most interesting to me is the convergence of water scarcity and oil scarcity. It's a real killer. CS, okay. Matt, I can't thank you enough. This has been a fantastic experience for me and I'm certainly looking forward to meeting you. MS. Excellent. For more information on this contributor, please visit http colon slash slash to greenenergy.com slash renewable dash energy dash facts dash fantasies slash dot